Well, happy holidays and Merry Christmas. I am your host, Anna Rossi, and you are watching The Chef's Pantry. You know, we are so lucky living in New England to be able to celebrate the season here. I mean, I just don't think it gets any better than where we live to get all those holiday feels. And it all starts in the kitchen. Um, to sort of really do the holiday right, we are with Amy Treviso. She is a true tastemaker. She is senior food editor at Yankee Magazine, which is, if you're a New Englander, you know that this is like the go-to handbook for all things great and fabulous that is going on culturally in this beautiful area that we live. She's also co-host of Weekends with Yankee. She is an author. She's an extraordinary chef. And we are, look at her. She's like rock climbing, digging clams, digging oysters. What doesn't this woman do? Certainly a true New Englander. And we're so lucky to be celebrating the holiday with her in her home kitchen. Hi, Amy. Hi, Anna. How are you? I love the tartan. I thought, you know, I thought I'd do plaid for the holiday. <laughs> I think that's a true New England fashion, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's such a treat to be with you on this holiday. And goodness, where haven't you been? You're busy. <laughs> What's been going on with you? We, well, you know, it's been such a strange year for all of us, obviously. But um, I have been able to do a little bit of traveling within sort of within the rules of travel. Um, and we actually did just film um, some segments for Weekends with Yankee over the past few weeks um, in Massachusetts, complying with our orders. Um, but uh, I'm very thrilled that we're going to have a fifth season of the show because that was very much up for, you know, up in doubt uh, back in the spring. We had no idea what was going to happen. So happily, we're going to have a fifth season. And, um, you know, we're not doing a lot of traveling right now, but generally I get to do a lot of fun travel around New England all the time. And this region is so diverse. There's so many things to see in a short drive. So I love that. Well, congratulations. As a viewer, I'm super excited. You're rolling into season five. And congratulations on the award. Yes. Yeah, so we, um, we just released our uh, annual uh, food awards, which are these awards that we created because there's a lot of awards for chefs. But I feel really strongly that it's also cheese makers and chocolate makers and, you know, all the kind of food makers and artisans who also make New England such a great place to live and eat. And so we wanted to bring some attention to them. So we released our awards recently. And this year we went with iconic New England foods like best stuffies, best chowder, best whoopie pies, best lobster roll kit. And these are all foods that you can get by mail. So you know, if you're, if you can't come to New England right now, or if you can't cross state lines, you can still get those foods. I know my husband would throw down any day for best stuffies. He's always, <laughs> oh, goodness, it's worth a good read. So speaking of iconic New England foods, I feel like we're really lucky because we're making what is iconic in your house on Christmas yeah. day. Tell us what we're making and why it's special. So this is my mom, Elaine's uh, cherry nut cake. And this is what we have for breakfast every Christmas. I mean, it, it truly would not be Christmas without this. And I thought it would just be fun to share a very beloved family recipe. I know that the recipe um, originally came from my grandmother, my mom's mother-in-law. So not her mother, but my dad's mom. And um, she, it, it, my mom believes that it has some sort of German origin, although we're totally Italian, but it's just so good. Who can resist it? And I'm guessing it's kind of a mid-century recipe because it has cream cheese in it. And I feel like that usually indicates that something's from like the 40s or 50s in baking. So, um, but it's delicious and it, it has walnuts in it, but also has um, almond extract. So you get a couple of different nut flavors and it just, it's so good. And it makes the kitchen smell great. Oh, I, I can imagine. Well, should we start assembling it and yes. dive in? Yes. Okay. okay well, so to begin. Yes. So we start with our dry ingredients. So I'm going to um, put the flour and baking powder and salt into a medium sized bowl. So there we go. And that's all you just salt, baking powder and flour and we're just going to whisk that together. So this cake is a cake that uses, you know, a creaming method. So your the next step is going to be to combine the butter and sugar and cream cheese. And that will uh, give you a little bit, that'll give you the texture basically that you want. It'll give you um, a little bit of aeration and a really nice crumb. I've been Great. watching, 
British baking show a lot lately. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm, I'm all about the sponge now, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it has that really dense pound cake kind of base. But yeah. I like with the maraschino cherries that we're going to toss in, it kind of has a nod, like an homage to the fruitcake. Yeah, so it is. It is, it is. I guess, technically a fruitcake in that it does have cherries and nuts in it, but there's a lot more cake to fruit ratio than the when, the fruitcake you might be thinking of. And um, we're not huge fruitcake eaters in my house, but we do really love this this one. This one is the one that wins. So this ain't your mama's fruitcake, right? Yeah, exactly. But this is your mama's It is my mom's, but it's not, yeah, it's not the other. My mom hails from Texas. So I get like a traditional fruitcake, which I actually love. I can, I can do it once a year, but this seems like a real party pleaser. Yeah. Does she make it like really far in advance? She doesn't make it. There's a company in Texas that they, they drop ship. Um, oh, that's great. It has like the candied pineapple and like all sorts of colored fruit. Yeah. Um, but I love pound cake. And I think that this is a really nice, a really nice seasonal yeah. recipe. So we're going to put um, our butter and our cream cheese. So it's one, eight ounces of cream cheese and a stick of butter. Uh, it makes a, a large cake. So you see a stick of butter or, you know, a, a stick of cream cheese going in, but just know that this, this will give you, you know, 16 slices. So it's not quite as naughty as it seems. I, I, I've never been afraid of a stick of butter. You are in good company. And now, Amy, you hail from Connecticut? Yeah, I grew up uh, in Windsor, Connecticut. And so I've lived in New England most of my life, a little bit of time out west in New Mexico and Cal in San Francisco, but came back. I know kind of where my home is, and we ended up coming back here. Yeah, that's so great. Um, so we're going to put this for a minute and give it a little whirl before we add the yeah. next ingredient. So Exactly. So we want to basically combine the, um, the cream cheese and butter, and then we're going to scrape down the sides halfway through. Great. I'm going to give it a, a quick blast. Here's the butter and the cream cheese. And I'm going to drop that. I, I have a little rubber spatula that I'm going to use to just... Yes. Pull it so down. we don't want anything to stick, and we want to get it just nicely kind of creamy and fluffy. Great. Okay, so there I have the sugar going in, and then we made sure that that was really light and fluffy before we added the eggs. Yeah. So we let the butter and the cream cheese go for about a minute, and then we add the sugar. And we you can let that go for four or five minutes. It really will improve the texture of your cake if you let it go that full amount of time. <laughs> Mine is so loud. I'm just going to go for it. Yeah. <laughs> so getting that aeration, is, what does that do? Because the pound cake is a dense cake. So how does yeah. that play into it? Yeah, so the, um, the, the sugar crystals are actually cu basically cutting little air pockets in the butter. These tiny little air pockets around them as they go through, they're almost like acting like tiny little knives cutting through the butter and making putting a little bit of air around them. And that it really shows up in the final cake. Like if you don't do this, extra, if you don't let it go for four minutes, you'll get a fine cake. It'll be fine. But when you go all the way to the four minute mark, it actually rises up a little bit above the, um, the pan. And this is a big pan. And Ooh. it's just the texture is so much better. So it's really worth being patient. Okay. Okay. So you know what I did? I love that you talk about this in your published recipe about using this as gifts. So that's one of my favorite things. I do with this with pumpkin bread. Um, but yeah. I love the idea of these little like individual servings that you can take around to your friends and neighbors and stuff them in their mailbox. Absolutely. And with this recipe, you could easily get four of those smaller cakes if you divide it evenly among the four pans. And so, you know, and then you can double it if you want um, and get eight cakes. Um, I probably wouldn't do more than double it. If I was, if I wanted to make like 12 or 16 of these, I would just make two batches. But, um, but yeah, you can get a lot of, a, a lot of nice gifts out of this. Okay. So rather than making everybody watch us go for a full four or five minutes, should we do like a little magic and television moment here? Let's do some TV magic. I can't wait to see what happens next after the sugar is properly whipped. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
Okay, so next we have the eggs. That's right. So we have four eggs, which feels like a lot, and yet the cake is very light and it doesn't feel heavy. So, um, so yeah, we'll put in our four large eggs that are at room temperature. Um, room temperature ingredients for cake are one of the other things that um, sort of improve the texture, improve the aeration of the cake, make it lighter and fluffier. I learned this trick recently, actually. Let me just show this really quickly. Um, Chef Douglas Williams showed me that when he cracks eggs, he cracks one against another one and only one will break. And he just finds that to be like a nice clean way to crack eggs. I tend oh. to just do it against the counter. Like, um, let me show you what I'm doing here. Sideways like that. Oh, nice. I like the, I like the egg test. Yes. Okay, so I'm putting them in all at once, but actually if you're making it at home, put them in one at a time, mix it between. I'm just kind of trying to speed up the process a little, but it's best to put them in one at a time. Great. And then it must be so them. fun for you getting these tips and tricks when you're in the field. Isn't that, I mean, you must get that too. It's so fun to learn from chefs. And, you know, there's, and that's one thing I love about, you know, we're, being a food writer is there's just, it's a lifelong learning process. You yeah. never stop learning. I love that about you. I feel, I, I feel like you are on the Renaissance pursuit and food is what sort of pulls you in. Yes. But how did you decide apples for your cookbook? Of yes, all the so things that you cook and eat, the Apple Lover's Cookbook. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's funny. I got married in an apple orchard. Um, and shortly thereafter, I was talking to a friend of mine who's, who's an agent, she's a literary agent. And she said, um, I think there's a place in the market for an apple book. Do you have any interest in apples? And I was like, are you kidding? I just had like a harvest festival disguised as a wedding. I'm completely into apples. So I started researching the book and working on the recipes. And the more I learned about them, the more fascinating they were, including the fact that they're not native to the US they're, or North America. They mm -hmm. had to be brought over from England, um, which I didn't know. And it just kept getting more and more interesting. I, I Do you have a favorite recipe in that cookbook? Um, oh, there's a few. There's a, there's a pork and apple pie that I love for the Ooh. holiday um, because it is just, it's so great. You can serve it like for brunch or for dinner or lunch. Um, and I love my grandmother's apple crisp, which is an unusual apple crisp, um, not your typical thing. Um, and then also, oh boy, there's so many, it's like choosing among your children. But um, I think also just the classic deep dish apple pie, because I'm a huge fan of uh, my crust. I think it's a great crust. So um, the deep dish apple pie is really good. Well, it's like, it's sort of like the pumpkin spice connoisseur when apple season hits in New England, we yes. just want all things apple. So Absolutely. I agree that cookbook has a place on the <laughs> shelf for sure. Um, but I have a homework assignment. Susan Tran on the, our NEC and morning show wants to know where you find those pink, what are they? The pink pillow apples? Pink lady apples. No, okay. pink, or the ones that are pink. Oh, on the sorry. Table. Pink pearl. Pink, pink pearl. pearl. Yeah. yeah. Okay, pink pearl apples are um, are apples that when you bite into them, the flesh, they look kind of like a brownish, pinkish apple on the outside. On the inside, they are, I swear, they're like Pepto-Bismol pink. I mean, they are, you wouldn't think that a fruit could be this color. Um, they're so good. They taste like raspberries. They, they, they have the same that the, the, um, they're called anthocyanins, but the, the, basically they, they have similar flavor compounds as raspberries and they were developed in California, but you can get them on the East coast. They're hard to find, but I found them at a place called Neshoba Valley winery in Bolton, Massachusetts. Oh, yeah. Actually, they have an heirloom apple orchard and they do grow pink pearl there as well okay. as a couple of other pink flush apple varieties. There's another one called Redfield. The inside is as just about as red as my collar. Just gorgeous apple, um, makes a great cider and is really also really nice to eat fresh. And you can grab a glass of wine while you munch. Exactly, on yes. The yes. Show. <laughs> Go apple picking, have some wine, have some cheese, it's pretty nice. Great. So I just went ahead and took my cake off the mixer, but it's probably a nice idea if you can to leave it on. Um, right. I'm gonna start adding my dry ingredients. Yes, so I'm pouring mine in. Um, at this point, if you've kind of done all the mixing like the recipe describes, you'll have a nice fluffy 
a mixture of butter, eggs, and cream cheese and sugar. So you can just pour all, you don't have to do fancy mixing, just all the dry ingredients go in at once. Great. So we'll mix that together. You do it by hand. Doing it by hand is, is always um, a good idea because it avoids over mixing. Like, you know, um, I'm doing it in the mixer. I'm just being very careful not to let it go too long. Like as soon as it comes together, I'm going to stop it. I'm going to take it off the stand and I'm going to do the rest of the mixing by hand. Okay. Super. And then I think I, I, I think some fruits and nuts are on our horizon, aren't they? Yes. And so now we, we put the ingredients in that give the cake its name, the cherries and nuts. Um, so these are, I have mar some maraschino cherries here that I've cut in half. Um, you do that because that way everybody gets more bites of maraschino. And also it prevents, it keeps them lighter so they don't sink to the bottom of the cake. Oh, good tip. So, which is always important. So yeah, we put in our, and this has also three tablespoons of the juice from the jar. Great. And so they add a beautiful kind of pinkish color as well as obviously a lot of flavor. And then we also add the walnuts and you can do that at the same time. And these are just chopped if walnuts that I bought. Keen on the maraschino cherries. What do you think? Like cranberries or pineapple? Like what would you say would be oh, good for sure? Cherry? Yes, if you if you don't want to do cherries, you can also do frozen um, frozen cherries if you don't want to do maraschino. I normally am not a huge maraschino cherry fan, but in this cake they really work. However, yes, you could definitely do dried dried sweet and cranberries. Um, you could do any you know dried apricots would be really delicious. Oh, I like that. So but there are a bunch of like if there's a dried fruit you love, use it. Use it. And that's one of the fun things about those recipes that only come out once a year. There's a place for the maraschino too. Yes. Yes. And it says the, the really kind of super sweet qualities of the maraschino. Oh, and before we do that, we also want to add our flavoring. So we have um, our vanilla and our almond extract. Great. I love how you come, you added the almond in addition to the vanilla. It's you know, it's nice. such a rich flavor um, with this cake, with the with those two flavoring agents and then the cherries. It's just, it's really, really good. And it's a little old fashioned. It's almost like, I don't know, almond extract feels a tiny bit old fashioned these days, but I feel like it should be rediscovered, you know, especially at the holidays. We love to have marzipan and, um, you know, little almond uh, macaroons and things like that. So this yeah. cake kind of has well, this flavor. Let's bring it back. I think a lot of things are coming back now. The other thing, have... I don't know if you feel this way. The other thing I'd love to see more in cooking that is old fashioned is um, cooking with things like port and Madeira and, you know, those mm -hmm. kind of fortified wines. Yeah, Such really good nice. flavor. Mm -hmm. And I love that the color itself has a little bit of a nostalgic feel with that pastel pink. Yes, it's like millennial pink, right? We're, <laughs> we're bringing it into the modern era. Okay, I'm going to pop this in the oven. Yes. Oh, and so this will need about 40 to 50 minutes at a simple 360. Easy peasy. Yes. And, and I'm just going to clean up my workstation here quickly. So great. we can take out the finished dish. And let's talk about cocktails in the spirit of, uh, in the spirit of the apple lover's yeah, it, so this book, I do have a cocktail recipe from the Apple Lovers Cookbook, and um, I wanted to make it because it has a sort of similar fun, festive color as, um, as the cake does, and it's called a Jack Rose cocktail. And the name Jack uh, comes from the fact that it is made with Applejack or Apple Brandy or Calvados, whichever one you prefer. Um, it is an Apple Brandy, and it, it comes in various forms, and they all work. Um, and then, so we have a couple of ounces of our apple brandy that we're going to put in a shaker with some ice. So this is a shaken cocktail. And then and we add a great provenance with the Ernest Hemingway reference and the sun also rises. One of my favorite books. What is it? I mean, I know the book, but what's the reference? The, he, um, Jack Barnes orders one at the bar. Oh, right. Oh, is that the Right. You're right. Is that the right? Is that the origin of the name? And am I confusing it with the Applejack? The Applejack? I It's some, somehow connected. But any right. references, the sun also rises. I think we could use a little bit more. Oh, that's so right? interesting. 
So um, then we have some, um, some either some grenadine, some pomegranate syrup. You can also just use pomegranate juice depending on how sweet you like your cocktail. Great. Oh, that's nice. And if you want to do something um, a little more scratch, I love that idea of reducing down the pomegranate. Yes, that's delicious. And then, yes, and then the juice of half a lime. So I've squeezed it already, but you can squeeze it right in there. So it's just three ingredients. And then you just put on your your top. And you give it a good holiday shake. Oh, this is earned it. This Christmas. And again, okay. really nice color too yes. with, with the grenadine in there. It's really pretty. Oh, that's pretty. Now I used a little bit of juice because I kind of was curious to try it with just the juice. I like the color of yours a little better, but I'm going to taste this one. I, I garnished with a couple of cranberries just for, because it's the holidays. <laughs> oh, cheers to the apples and the Christmas. Oh, I like this too. Yeah, this is very okay. good. So Amy, the slice. Mm -hmm. I have to know you are a woman that's traveled all through New England. What do you think is the ultimate food destination when it comes to like a great town or city? Yeah. Well, I think if you want to have like a foodie weekend where you kind of park yourself in one spot, walk around and have a lot of variety. Um, I think Portland, Maine is really hard to beat because there is so much within walking distance of the old port with just Munjoy Hill, that whole area. So it's, you know, some of the places like Sushi Miyake and Minato, um, which is a sort of Japanese um, kind of tapas, um, izakaya spot, um, Holy Donut, um, just yeah. such good, such good bakery standard baking company. It, it's, it's hard to beat that as a food destination. Yeah, there's so many people, great talented chefs that have moved north uh, so yeah. they can really show off their culinary chops in a, yeah. in a great spot. When it comes to great cooking equipment and utensils, gadgets, do you have a favorite? Um, I, you know, I, of course I love like my KitchenAid and, and those things, but in there's, you know, when I was working on the Apple book, um, I became very enamored of the old fashioned Apple core peeler. Do you know those yes. machines? Boy, you can process a lot of apples quickly <laughs> with that thing. Um, and you know, having like having a quick read, like thermometer, you know, a, a thermopen or whatever sort of brand you're looking at. I mean, like cakes, for example, with the cake we're baking right now, it's perfectly done when it's at 210 degrees, which, you know, maybe you want to just look for visual cues. But if you want that surefire knowledge that the inside of the cake is cooked, there's no better way than to stick that, you know, thermopen in there and get your 210 degree reading. That's great. It takes the toothpick test to the next level. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what about the best piece of advice you've been given? Um, you know, I, it's funny. I've been um, working with GBH on some videos where we, we're, we're making some of Julia Child's classic recipes. Um, and I, I think it's her fearlessness is something that I really... Um, really that I fall back on when I'm cooking. If I'm trying something new that I'm a little bit nervous about, I picture her doing something difficult, like making a souffle or flambéing something on camera. Um, and she would just go for it. And so I'll, I'll sort of have her voice in my head of like, just go for it, just do it. And, um, and that really helps. Like, so, cause there are things that all of it, you know, there are things that are new to any of us when we're mm -hmm. cooking, you never know everything. And so to have that confidence to just give it a try and realize at the end of the day, it's dinner. And it'll still be something you can eat and it's fine. But just in your case, there are cameras documenting. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> you need a little, little courage here. A and little, there, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's do a little TV magic and bring okay. in the cake because yes. this one needs a few more minutes. Um, but my kitchen already smells amazing because yes. I mean, this is what came out a little bit ago. So and I'm going to dust it now with a little powdered sugar. You could make an icing for this if you wanted to, but um, I think a little snow of powdered sugar is so pretty. And you have and a great little, little tool there too. I like that little dusting tool that you have. Yeah, you know, I, this is like a multi-purpose. This I use it to make tea, loose leaf tea, but also it's actually great for dusting powdered sugar. Okay, and, and you don't save this for dessert on Christmas. I love no. that you go straight in in the morning. 
Right. So this is our break. Our Christmas morning breakfast is basically scrambled eggs, sausages, and this lovely cake. And um, it's the perfect thing to make in advance because if there are kids involved, like we have, um, you want to get, you don't want to fuss around with breakfast. You want to get right to the presents, right? We totally want to, and have a little something to raise the blood sugar because it's been a late <laughs> night for a lot of us. This is gorgeous. I love the maraschino cherries and walnuts, that little nuance of the almond extract to pull in with the vanilla. The yeah. Thing of powdered sugar. I, I can just picture this with scrambled eggs and some good hearty like maple sausage. Yes. It's just, it's just sweet enough. It's, it's, it's really moist. It's fluffy. Mm. I love it. Oh, and it will, as soon as I bite into this, it's really going to feel like Christmas for me. <laughs> mm. And then you'll get to do it all again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I might freeze it. <laughs> mm. Oh, it's this so good. Delicious. What a delicious memory to have speak to Christmas morning. Mm. Yeah. And now my, my, my kid requests it. Um, you know, just like I used to request it when I was little. And it's a really nice thing. That's the best part when you know a good memory makes your kids love you that much more than something tasty. <laughs> well, Merry Christmas, Amy. Merry Christmas. Cheers. It was Cheers. such a pleasure. And thank you so much for sharing a recipe that's so near and dear to your family. Thank you so much for having me. It really is a treat. I hope you have a wonderful holiday. I'll see you on WGBH. Great. <laughs> Hi. So fun. I love the holidays and it's so fun. We want to hear from you what your holiday menus are, what your recipes are, that it just wouldn't be the year or the holiday without. This is what's so fun about the Chef's Pantry, sharing these things. Um, you guys, we have a great week ahead. We have Mom to Mom on Wednesday, uh, the, hub, the Hub Today and the Hub Today weekend. Um, and we'll be back next week on Monday on Facebook Live at 4 p.m. with the Chef's Pantry. Happy holidays. Cheers. <laughs>